SJC 13485, Dananjay Patel versus 7-Eleven Inc. et al. Okay, Attorney Luce Reardon. Okay, uh, good morning, Your Honors. I'm Shannon Luce Reardon. For plaintiffs with me, Matthew Carreri. The answer to the certified question in this case must be yes, because the certified question describes pretty much every employment relationship that exists. Um, that is, that obligations are pursued are performed pursuant to a contract, well, an agreement that may either be written or implied, and the employer obtains revenue based upon the labor that's performed by the employee. So the way that the First Circuit has certified this question, there's really, there can be no other answer besides for yes, unless the court were to decide that somehow it should be looked at differently because this is a franchise, Doesn't and that's something the court rejected last time. Doesn't it apply to every business relationship that's ever existed too? Um, every contract, forget about employment contracts, doesn't this cover every contract ever created in, by mankind as well? Well, part of the answer to that is by the fact that no court before the district court in this case has ever used this predecessor to the ABC requirements of 148B as a way of limiting even applying the ABC analysis. Yes, it's very broad. What's that? What about Sebago? Didn't they do the threshold inquiry first? Well, yeah, yes, no. They did, but they did not restrict an analysis of the ABC factors based on that threshold inquiry. No, no court has. Um, not exactly. If you look at the decision, they did for the radio associations. For the garage owners. For, for the medallion. The end of the inquiry for those garage owners. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the third part that wasn't talked about as much. Yes, for the garage owners, right. because so there wasn't, there wasn't. As court as ever, we have. OK, well, so there wasn't much um, focus on that. I've never seen so any other court. Something. It may not mean much, but it does mean something. Not everybody is an employer. Well, well, no, of course not. And that's what the ABC factors recognize that. And Well, no, I'm talking about the threshold inquiry. The threshold inquiry in that case said that the garage owners, even though they had some benefit flowing to their business from the fact that they serviced the taxi cabs and did the credit cards that were required to be installed in the taxi cabs, they were not employers. So it does have some teeth, although they may be blunted. I, you know, I agree with you. Right, although in that case, there weren't really any obligations that the taxi drivers were performing with respect to the garage owners. That brings me to the question. What is the obligation that your clients are performing uh, for the franchise? Well, they are running the stores. They're managing the 7-Eleven stores. They are making sure that they're staffed 24 hours a day, 364 days a year. They are following the detailed instructions, including the thousand-plus page so manual. The stores. How is it a service for 7-Eleven? So 7-Eleven has both so-called franchise stores as well as corporate-owned stores, so how and the is franchisees a store a service for 7-Eleven. It's it's a service just the same way as the managers in the corporate-owned stores are performing a service for 7-Eleven. They are overseeing the store's operations to make sure that products are sold, that the cash register is staffed, that stock is kept on the shelves, that customers That's come in. That's the difference between uh, owner-operated stores and the franchise stores. What Do, do the, the owner-operated stores, do they own the business, the underlying business? I'm trying to figure out. When you say they, are you referring to, who are you referring to? Okay, so your clients are actually own uh, the underlying franchise, right? Well, that's what 7-Eleven says, just like the cleaning franchisor said in the cleaning cases. So the gross uh, profits. Yeah, yes, that's correct. Our managers in the 7-Eleven owned stores get a percentage of the store profits? 
Well, we don't know from the record how they're paid, but it's not uncommon for managers to be paid based on some incentive-based system where the amount of profit influences the amount of compensation that they receive. So they have some sort of ownership stake is what you're saying? Well, it depends on how you define ownership stake. In order to endorse what 7-Eleven has done and say that we don't even get past this threshold inquiry gives employers wide latitude to commit an end run around the wage laws because countless I'm just companies figure out what services your client is performing for 7-Eleven. I mean, I know that the AG will argue its own case um, after you, but is it the payment of the franchise fee? Is it the conformity to the 7-Eleven uh, mandates in order to maintain the value of its, you know, same experience anywhere in the world, 7-Eleven mark? Uh, what, what is it that your client is providing? It's, it's, follow 7 it's following 7-Eleven's rules to operate 7-Eleven stores, just like the managers do. Is it possible in your view that anybody can, um, uh, any entity like 7-Eleven or McDonald's or any of those other sort of trademark, same, same experience anywhere in the world kind of uh, companies, is it possible to have that kind of business and, 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 and not meet the threshold inquiry? Or is it under your plan that this threshold inquiry is gonna be met by any franchise? Well, I can't say any franchise because I don't know the facts of other cases that aren't before us, but I think the crux of this what, what, question- what, what franchise would pass your test, even if you don't know all of them? Well, I mean, I don't know, because I don't know every franchise in the world. I think the crux of the question here isn't the question that's before this court now. It's possibly the next time this case might get before this court on the actual application of the ABC test, and that's certified. whether prong B. Let's stick with the certified question. Yes. I don't want to get into the ABC, because that's not been certified. Um, but this question, is there any franchise? So what, what is your test for this threshold inquiry? Um, the test is whether, as the question stated and as the statute says, whether, um, well, whether services are provided, whether obligations are performed pursuant to an agreement, which may be written or implied, and there is revenue, the employer, purported employer's revenue is based, um, where there is, um, where the employer makes its money based on the um, alleged employee's labor. So, so in the garage situation, flat fee. Exactly. That was the distinction. Not trigger the threshold inquiry. That is the distinction that this court made in Sebago. Correct. And that was part of why the garage owners were on one side because they just received flat payments. Whereas in Sebago, I didn't see anything about flat payments in Sebago. Because there was a distinction drawn between the Parks case and the um, O'Hare Medway case in Sebago, and that was talked about both with respect to the threshold inquiry and prong B, which is why it's a little confusing. But there was a distinction that was drawn there that because the revenue of the defendant um, in the case with the limo company um, did derive its revenue based on a percentage of what was brought in by the drivers. Um, their services were provided, um, or in what this court intimated, that, that was relevant to the prong B inquiry, whereas if it was a flat payment, then that wasn't the case. So that was the, an important distinction. <laughs> the limo case, and you're much more familiar with these than I am, in the limo case, did the limo drivers provide uh, transportation to the clients of the alleged employer? Yes. Okay. Yes, and that's the same thing here because 7-Eleven advertises itself as a convenience store. The people who walk into the store know that they're walking into a 7-Eleven. They don't know that they're walking into um, Joe Smith's convenience store. So they are customers of 7-Eleven. It, it's I not... Know. Does this apply? So these, some of these guys are sort of what I consider owners. You know, they're not, you know, they're not, does this rule, does, is this requirement satisfied even if this, these, any of the named plaintiffs did never, no work whatsoever in the store and they just owned the store and had other people work for them? 
Well, that might be a different question. All of these plaintiffs. Isn't one of it, but these, does that matter? If, if the services have nothing to do with employment, does that matter? I mean, because we're trying to, the purpose, I mean, again, I feel like we're putting a square peg into a round hole, but the purpose of the Wage Act is to protect employees and to protect relationships like that janitor case where they really are employees, but you're making, pretending them to be franchisees. But these guys are businessmen. Well, that's uh, how, that's but, how but, 7-11. But, but bear, bear with me for a second, because I just want to pose, it, it, it's related to Justice Wenlin's question, are there different kinds of franchises? And if, if the employment of these guys is minimal, meaning these guys are owners, they're, like one of the gentlemen, again, I'm basing it on the brief. I haven't read this whole record. One of the gentlemen owns a bunch of stores. He has a real estate business. He has a, stores that aren't 7-Eleven um, stores. And how many hours does that gentleman work? Why am I considering him an employee? And no, we, shouldn't the services you're performing be employment services? We, so we are talking about plaintiffs did do the work in the stores and all of the facts that you just set forth that Sanford 11 is trying to emphasize, that's what they said about the cleaning franchisees also. Many no, of them had yeah, other I, businesses. I've read, the facts. I've, I've read the Ireland decision on the cleaning employees. They are really just being exploited. Um, this is quite different. But um, some, of these, some of these franchisees work 70, 80 hours in the stores and are effectively making less than minimum wage when you actually consider the amount that they take after 7-Eleven takes out all the deductions. The facts of these cases are really not different. Facts of this case are really not that different from the Those, cleaning that, franchise that's my cases. Question. Does it matter whether they work in the store? Yes, like, I think, no, I think, so it, I think it does. I think it does, and the plaintiffs here do. And also- Give me an example, what percentage of the time Give, take the person, the most extreme example, the man who has multiple businesses. So how many hours does he work in this store? I, I don't think we have that in the record, but I will say that they're managing. Oh, say, he worked, they're, say he worked three hours a week. Right. Um, does that mean he's still subject to this act? So as Judge Wolf noted in one of the cleaning cases, Judge Giovanni versus Jana King, mm -hmm. Cleaning and getting people to clean, managing the cleaners is part of the work. So these so-called franchisees are managing, making sure people are there and performing the work. In today's world, we know that not all work is done on site. A lot of it is done remotely. So I don't know the facts about the particular plaintiffs and how many hours they were in. Some of these franchisees, though, they, they're not making enough money to even hire other people to work behind the the register. It's often the franchisees and their family members are running these stores, keeping them open 24 hours a is day. That an there is exploitation is that an just like in the franchise. I'm just cleaning this cases. is this yes. is almost incomprehensible. So I'm trying yes. to understand and services, you define services in an incredibly broad way. He defines this saying, you know, it, it's I'm just trying to understand. I go back to Justice Wendland's decision, our decision in Patel. We're saying we're dealing with a, a problem which is treating em, employees who are really employees like they're not. And I'm just, I just don't have a sense that this is the same thing, but I can't put my fingers right. around it. Justice you know. Kafka, I think some of the questions that you're getting at are going to be more appropriate questions when we get to the application of the ABC test. The last time this case was before this court, it seemed clear that the court was expecting it to go back to the district court to have the ABC test applied, and then we would be grappling with some of these questions. Instead, what the court did was it gave teeth to something that would give employers throughout the Commonwealth an opportunity to conflate facts and twist things into making it seem like actual employees are not employees and allow them to evade the wage law. Where the franchisee is itself a corporation. Do we have that presented to us here, or are they all individual? No, some of them have incorporated and some have not, and there's Who case is law. The employee in the ones that are the corporations? It's, it's the actual 
person who does the work, who, who runs the stores, who is effectively the manager of the store. And there's case like at Site U from around the country, including the Department of Labor, said the fact that someone has incorporated or formed an LLC does not make them not an employee. That's another ruse that employers use in order to make it look like employees are not actually employees. There's, there's a whole wealth of tricks that employers use. If this court is to say no to this question, no, it's going to unleash more tricks. About you know who the employee is in the case where the franchisee is a corporation, and, and you're saying it's the individual store manager. It's the person who's actually doing the work, and it's clear in this case who that person is. Uh, the person running the cashier, I mean, who, who's actually? No, in, in the case here, with the plaintiffs that are before this court, every one of them actually worked in the stores. A couple of them the other incorporated. Employees, they, uh, their employees also worked in the stores, right? Yes, right, so but this case isn't about that. You're out from you. Um, and I apologize, <laughs> um, Chief. Um, what is the legal principle that stops this at the store owner uh, versus all the employees of that store. Well, that would be a different case. That would be a case more like the Jinx case where it would be a joint employment question because on paper, the franchisee is the employer of the other people who work in the store. The question that you're asking is whether those employees are also employees of 7-Eleven. That would be a joint employer inquiry. That's not presented by this case. Here it is clear who the franchisee is. When, in response to my question about the corporate entity being the franchisee, your response was it was the managers who are actually doing the work. No, 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 that's no. I'm saying the franchisees, each of the five franchisees who are plaintiffs in this case, were actually acting like managers running each of the stores, no different from the acknowledged managers who run 7-Eleven's corporate-owned stores. There's really not any f um, functional difference between the franchisees here and those managers and the work done by the managers who 7-Eleven acknowledges are employees who run the corporate-run stores. And so we cited the Amero case for you where you have a company that has some people classified as employees, some classified as independent contractors. They're doing the same thing. But those 7-Eleven-owned stores, all of the people working the store are employees. Right, but again, this case well, isn't addressing... Then again, and maybe you don't have an answer, and that's fine, is what is your limiting principle? Why do these corporate entities that are franchisees default to the person running the store equivalent and not all the other 7-Eleven employees? Because here, the plaintiffs here, um, I believe three of whom incorporated, they, those individuals incorporated and are the ones who signed the franchise agreement and are the ones who are on the hook to perform the obligations that 7-Eleven has required. And what they're doing is the same as people who sign those agreements in their individual capacity. There's no issue that's raised here about, are we talking about the franchisee, or are we talking about the manager, the night manager who works the, the night shift? Right, that, not for your question, but for mine it is. Well, <laughs> right, right, but I need to write, uh, we need to write some sort of legal principle um, that cabins this at what you're suggesting, the name plaintiffs, and not everybody else who works at 7-Eleven is suddenly the employee of corporate 7-Eleven. Right, but again, answering yes to the certified question would not lead to this unanswerable series of questions that you seem to be posing. Again, the people who are classified as employees who are working under the franchisees, who are working the cash register, stocking the shelves, et cetera, they are employees on paper um, of, of the franchisee. And just like in the cleaning cases, same thing happened. Plenty of these cleaning franchisees had employees working for them, and defense counsel here argued to many courts, you see, they can't possibly be employees because they themselves have employees. And courts rejected that, and um, the Department of Labor has rejected that, and courts around the country have rejected that, which I can I could provide for the court if you'd like additional citation. That's not raised by this case. Here, we're talking about the franchisees. Two of these plaintiffs here never incorporated, so there's no question with respect to them. You can't say you can't meet the threshold inquiry of, the, of 148B because you incorporated or formed an LLC. That would put Massachusetts near the bottom of the states in terms of employee protections when we're well known to have one of, if not the strongest wage law in the country protecting employees. On that 
Sorry, last question for me um, on that um, issue on the LLC. Was that a requirement that 7-Eleven corporate made? I don't think it's in the record yet whether it was required or not. There may have been at different points in time different requirements. I, I do know that in, we often see this come up in these independent contractor cases all the time that sometimes the um, the alleged employees have been asked to incorporate, sometimes they've been told to, sometimes it's been suggested to them that they can. Um, and the dividing line shouldn't be whether they were required to or not, because employers have ways of suggesting it without requiring it. And again, it's been rejected around the country, and I could provide you case sites that that is not what the court looks at. And again, some of these questions I feel like are going to the what will come up in the ABC analysis itself. I, again, when this court last saw this case, it seemed clear. Although you, you, you're, you, you know it's going to be a rough hoe, road to hoe. Can I ask this question? Say one of these people, and I, I'm not saying this is the facts. I'm just posing a hypothetical. Got a franchise agreement, and the chief of chief person, head manager, is making $3 million a year on the franchise. He's also working, or she's working, three hours there. Um, it, it, does that mean they're employees? Um, I'm, no, no 7-Eleven franchisee is making three million I know, but I'm, I'm they're dealing, making, they're I'm making just franchise. over minimum wage, if at all. Okay, but let's let's we're dealing with all franchise in in another respect too. I'm just trying to understand if someone's making millions of dollars in one of these franchises, because I, I assume you don't do this unless there's a potential, big potential upside. Well, Are every chief, I, again, I'm, you know, we're dealing with something that has the potential to warp the employment laws, meaning a manager who's really, you know, an entrepreneur making a huge amount of money is entitled to wages too. I'm just, is that, if that, in that hypothetical, I'm not saying it's this case, is that, hypoth is that person also an employee covered by the Wage Act? He, well, just they make couple. $3 million from profits, and they work a couple of hours a week because they have 100 other employees there. Is that, is that person covered by the Wage Act? Well, I, I just want to say a couple of things. But just are, answer the question one I don't, way or the I other. Don't know, I don't know the facts of it. No, no 7-Eleven franchisee is making $3 million a year. Executives could make millions of dollars a year and still be employees, right? In the cleaning cases, the cleaning companies always tried to argue, oh, our franchisees, they're making millions of dollars a year. They have all these other businesses. Those arguments were rejected. That's but not, you, that's uh, not help, the help inquiry. Help me out. If a franchisee is the owner of the franchise and is making a huge amount of money, and again, the answer may be yes, that person like the CEO you're talking about. Is that what you're saying, though? Is that, is that, that's the purpose of the... The wage acts are meant to cover that. It's a question. Wage, it's not a, the wage I'm not act to does cover it. the wage act does high, cover highly compensated employees as well as low wage earners and owner people who are owning something and making a lot of money. Right. So the the issue is is that the scheme that Seven Eleven has set up here is it makes it calls these people owners and they're not really owning something because they're not really running their own business. Franchise. A traditional franchise, the problem is, is the word franchise brings up visions of McDonald's. And you think of someone who's running this big fast food restaurant and they must be making millions of dollars because why else would they invest in it? These are, it's a largely an immigrant workforce who have been um, put in this situation where they pay all this money thinking that they will be able to run their own business, but when you actually get into the weeds of it, they are just carrying out the detailed instructions that 7-Eleven has asked them to carry out, and no different from managers. This is not like McDonald's or traditional franchises, where in a traditional franchise, the franchisee pays three or four percent as a, as a franchise royalty fee to the franchisor. Here, it's 50%, well, but, but that, but that's which my is question. fundamentally different. That's my question, though. In that, is that person also an employee under your world? Do the distinction. I understand you're saying these people are like the janitors being exploited. And you may very well be right. But this other franchise where you're making lots of money and it's only 3% profit, whatever you're talking about, are those also employees? No, I don't think they are. And I think the answer is really going to come more when we get to the ABC test under prong B, because I don't think that McDonald's is 
and is a hamburger seller. I think McDonald's is known as a franchisor, whereas 7-Eleven, the way it holds itself out, it is in the They're convenience drawing. store business. You're walking down a slippery slope then. No, I know, but I'm just, I'm explaining why courts, other than, you're right, with the garage owners in Sebago, courts have not, in Massachusetts, really dwelled on this as a threshold inquiry that has any teeth to it. And when California expressly looked around the country and the California Supreme Court had decided to adopt the Massachusetts ABC test because it was the strongest test around, um, there's been a lot of litigation now of, about that test that California expressly plucked out from Massachusetts and applied. And the courts there said that this initial inquiry, providing services, that's not an inquiry. We're not going to use that to limit who we apply the ABC test to. We do. So you're saying McDonald's franchisees are different. They would survive the threshold question. Or would, I guess, no, you're saying that. No, I'm saying when you get to the ABC test, there may be a different analysis, correct. But they would, McDonald's franchisees are also performing a service for McDonald's because it's such yeah. a low bar. Yeah, yes, exactly. Because I just want to caution this court that if you, even thinking that this is protecting the Wage Act for being used to protect multi-million dollar earners, if you create, if you allow this threshold inquiry to become an actual um, gatekeeper in a way that it really hasn't been in all the dozens and dozens of cases that have been decided in the Commonwealth, it is going to be misused by employers who are going to say, see, um, you worker in different industry, you don't even perform services, we're not even going to let you get to the very worker-friendly ABC test. It is going to be abused and misused, and I urge the court not to allow that to happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Attorney Kravitz. Thank you, Chief Justice Budd. May it please the court, David Kravitz on behalf of the Attorney General. Um, we asked to participate in this argument as we did in the First Circuit because we view the question presented in this case as an extremely significant one. The uh, threshold inquiry under Section 148B is implicated in literally every misclassification case that is brought in the Commonwealth, whether by the Attorney General or by private parties. And the district court, the federal district court's approach to resolving the question was, in our view, not consistent with the text of the statute and not consistent with this court's case law. Um, this court has or is well familiar with the harms of misclassification, as it recently summarized in the Patel case uh, in this, uh, earlier in this very litigation. Uh, it harms workers, it harms businesses that play by the rules, and it harms uh, 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 state and federal governments. The so AG's position is that the franchise fee itself satisfies the threshold inquiry. Not the franchise fee necessarily. Okay, so what is the position? It, it, so the, the posi so our, our view, just to sort of cut to the chase, I suppose, um, uh, is, is that uh, if you look at what happened in Sebago, it is clear that when there is a, uh, when the revenue flowing to the employer, the putative employer, is, quote, directly dependent on the work, unquote, of the, uh, of the, uh, the worker, whatever, whatever work the worker may be doing, then uh, that gets you over the threshold inquiry, and that gets you into the ABC test. But so here- about that. that the yeah. radio dispatchers in that case, which is where that comes from, right? Correct. Yeah. Were actually, they had clients for whom they were giving vouchers, and the drivers were performing that work. Correct. And, and so it's more than just the dispatcher's um, revenue was directly dependent on the driver's Work. It was that the work being done was directly for the dispatcher's clients. And, and, and I think that that was 7-Eleven's point. It's brief. I'm not being particularly unique. But can you respond to that? Sure. No, I mean, I think the work, the work that the drivers were doing, remember, the, the drivers were, at the end of the day in, in Sebago, were, were not deemed to be the employees of either the medallion owners or of the radio associations. They were deemed to be independent contractors. So the work they were doing was work they were doing for themselves. They were making money. Money by uh, collect, by taking fares and driving uh, passengers around the city. Uh, the the key point from Sebago again is quote the revenue flowing to the radio association through the voucher program is directly dependent on the driver's work of uh, transporting passengers. And the court went on to say uh, that the plane, the drivers were not required 
to participate in the voucher program. They presumably could have not taken vouchers and just said it was cash but only. But they did. But they did, and because they did, uh, that is precisely what they did. That constituted a service for the radio associations because it's eight cents on every dollar uh, that was going to the radio. So that's where they make their money, and so that is the service. The position is that it doesn't matter that the work was being performed for the dispatcher's client. Uh, I, that's correct. I mean, the, the, the work, the work that, the, the, again, the, the drivers were working for themselves to make money. They were driving uh, the, the corporate clients Absolutely. around. You can yeah. work for yourself to make money and also do the work of your employer. Sure, I suppose so. That's yeah. exactly what the dispatcher's uh, situation was, that they, 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 you know, got the call from the client and then they said, yeah, we'll give you a ride, and some driver did perform the work. Yeah. Some driver did the... Your position, though, is that it doesn't matter whether or not that work was performed by the driver, so long as the dispatcher's revenues were somehow dependent. Our position is, yes, our position is that where the revenues are directly dependent on the work that the drivers are doing, uh, that I think that's, this is what Sebago held, uh, that that is enough. That gets you over the threshold inquiry. And again, significantly, I think, for, for uh, this case as well as, as that case, that gets you into the ABC test, and we don't know what the result will be in the ABC test. Your position is that performing any services means that the putative employer receives some revenue. Some revenue that is directly dependent on the work of the plaintiffs. That is one way of satisfying the uh, performing any service inquiry. There may well be other ways. Uh, and, and it may be that, that other things that the franchisees in this case are doing would also satisfy the inquiry. How would any franchise survive in Massachusetts under the threshold inquiry? Or are you saying that's just such a modest inquiry that the ABC test will uh, solve uh, for any franchise. So, I mean, I, th I think this court ad addressed that very issue in its previous iteration in this case, in the Patel case, where the, the, the argument was made that if you allow the ABC test, if you allow Section 148B to be applied to franchising, it will end franchising in Massachusetts. This and court the AG's position in that case was it will not. Correct. And that's what this court said. This court said, in fact, it will not. There's no reason to think that it will. But and it, it described 7-Eleven's argument as a faulty premise that there will be no way for them to get out from under the ABC test. So, but, so, I, so is every franchise... I'm just trying to understand, is, is there any limitations on this? Again, the guy I think owns, it's going the, to be fran owns the franchises, making multi-million dollars from profits. The AG's view is that's, that's, um, that person's covered by the Wage Act. It's that's going what the to do, well, they're absolutely covered. I mean, they may be covered by the Wage Act. As, as my colleague said, there is no, owners, there's no earning does, limitation under do, the Wage Act. Do, do, even if they don't work? there? If they don't do anything there? It's going to be a question of the facts of but every on, but, case. Uh, but just bear with me. You sure. own the franchise. You're making a gross, a lot of profits. I'm not saying that's this case. But you own the franchise. You make profits. And you don't do any work there. You, you hire the employees and you don't do any work. Are you still covered by the Wage Act according to the... I mean, the, quest, the question for purposes of the threshold inquiry is, are you providing services to the putative employer? I know, but, you know, that, it's like... I don't know what the answer to that will be in a hypothetical world. There's no way to answer that question. Well, well help me out then, because do the services have nothing to do with employment? Because the Wage Act is an employment act, isn't it? Well, I mean, sure, the Wage Act has to do with employment, but I, but I think but, it would be, I think but this court has rejected. That, I think you're telling me, though, that the performance of services has nothing to do with employment. Well, it depends. Is that what so you're saying? It depends what know, you mean. Really if you're, if you're saying that employment means work for I can't, pay. I, well, it, employment means I go to work and I, I get paid to do work in the place as opposed to I own the business. So... If I may, I think what you're saying... No, I, I can't follow what the AG is saying, so tell me what it means. Does the, is the AG saying if I own the business and it's a franchise business and I don't do any hours there, I'm still an employee... Physically the in the store, is that your question? Yeah. I don't know that there's a geographical limitation in, in Section 148B. But there's I, no I difference between that. owners and employees then under the Wage Act in the franchise context. Is that, I just, that's what I'm struggling with. 
I mean, again, I it's going to depend on the terms of any particular franchise agreement. There may well be ways of designing a franchise agreement that would not constitute performing services for the employer. I don't know. But you, but. you think, I and mean, again, you're our best guide on what the legislature was intending. You think the legislature's intending for owners who are really being paid out of profits to also being employees in all these franchise agreements. And I'm just trying to understand if that's the AG's position or not. Again, we're obviously not taking a, any position on how the ABC test is going to apply in this case, mm -hmm. because that, that's the ultimate question. Well, we, are they employees? The, that's ABC the ABC test cross-references services. The first prong of the thing goes, the individual is free from control and direction in connection with the performance of the service. Then the next one, the service is performed outside the usual course of business. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm just trying to understand, does service include any, that you do work as opposed to you own the business, you know? I mean, service has always been understood by this court as a very broad word. Had the, had the legislature intended to narrow it, it surely would either have defined the word service, which it did not do, or it could have done what the statutes in New Jersey and Indiana did, um, that were cited by 7-Eleven, the ac and Dogs cases and the Kirby case, could have added in words like services performed for remuneration. That looks a lot like work for pay. That is the argument that is essentially the position that the district court adopted. That's essentially what 7-Eleven and some of its amici are urging here. But those words do not appear in Section 148B. And so, you know, I think the, the answer to the question is the statute essentially says what it says. If there's a problem with the statute, that is a question for the legislature, not for this court. When a franchisee is a corporation, I, I know you heard this question I asked. Uh, yeah. Uh, who is the employee? Under so, it, the yeah, it, so this court has actually addressed that question in a case called Chambers. I'm not sure it's in any of the party's briefing, but the citation is 476 Mass 95. It's from 2016. And the court uh, said in that case that just because uh, there's a corporate form, uh, that does not mean that you can't bring uh, a misclassification claim. It's a very intensely fact-based fact determination, and I do not know whether, uh, the, whether the, uh, the franchisees that are corporations in this case would qualify or not. I just don't, you know, I'm not sufficiently familiar with the record to say. Anything. I have, yeah. sorry, is um, performing any service, if, if we adopt the AG's position that it, it means um, that the employer's revenue is directly dependent on the work. What implications have you thought of uh, for the word service in the ABC test? Right. If performing any service means employer's revenue is directly dependent on the employee's work. Mm -hmm. That's one, one way of satisfying it, yes. Uh, how, what implications would, would that have on the ABT test that uses the word service as well? I'm, I guess I'm not sure I'm following your question. It's the same question you have. All right, well, I, I'll, I'll figure it out. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Attorney Leon. No, no, take your time. <laughs> take your time. One second. Yes, of course. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court. Norman Leon for the Appellee 7-Eleven. Uh, Your Honors, to the, the answer to the very narrow certified question, which is specific to franchised businesses, must be no because there is nothing about that test that distinguishes legitimate business relationships from misclassification, and there is no limiting principle whatsoever. It would turn an untold number of ordinary legitimate business relationships immediately into presumptive employment relationships. And Justice Wenland, to go back to your question, which was not really answered, there is no limiting principle here at all because every single franchisor would immediately wake up tomorrow as a presumptive employer of all of its franchisees in the Commonwealth if the answer to the certified question was yes. And let me explain but, why. But, but isn't, isn't that the whole point of the of the low threshold inquiry that, that it's almost a presumption that yes, you are an employer. I mean, to, to the AG's point, um, that it's really supposed to be a very low bar. Uh, I don't see anything in the statutory text or the legislative history which 
indicates that that language in the statute is supposed to be given any meaning other than its ordinary meaning. Service means something. Well, it something. is definitely a remedial statute. And you've read, I'm sure, all the cases that I've read that say we interpret this thing really broadly. It is also the position, at least, that the AG is taking today is inconsistent with the position it took previously and the position this court has laid out. It was specifically noted by the AG before and by Patel that there is nothing in the Wage Act that precludes legitimate franchise businesses from operating in the Commonwealth. Take a look at the two prongs that the AG and the plaintiffs are telling you should be the well, determination they, for employment. You're not precluded from operating. You're just, you're going to have to treat the franchisee as an employee is basically what they're I mean, you're not precluded from the relationship. You're just not outside the Wage Act, is what they're saying. Well, then there is no franchise relationship. You have an employment relationship. Well, they're saying you have both. I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with it, but that's what they're saying is, and you're right, I don't see any limiting principles, but I think they're basically saying that you're going to have to abide by the Wage Act laws, too, for at least every hour that even the owners work. No one's even come up with a suggestion of how that's feasible. It's not feasible, meaning you're going to have to change the business structure to make it profitable for you, that, I take it. But they're arguing the legislature, I, I'm not saying they're right, but they're clearly saying that everyone there fits the literal meaning of this. Um, and therefore, franchisees are not illegal, but they're going to have to change their business model is what they're saying. Well, not just franchisees, commercial lessors, licensors of patents, trademarks, and copyrights, well, I don't know. music well, publishers, book well, why, publishers. Why isn't the limiting principle the ABC test? Because and I mean, we still don't have an answer to uh, Justice Kafka and Justice Wenland's question of if we're going to de define services as the appellants uh, want us to, we still have the issue of how you port that definition into the ABC test. But why isn't the ABC test? Because the, the, it's not as if you meet the low threshold and say you're presumptively an employer, that that it ends the inquiry. And, and I, I do want to make that point, Your Honor. I think that's a great question, because I think with respect, the court's being led down the primrose path a little bit by that argument, and here's why. The test that they're proposing as the service threshold is exactly the standard that this court applied in applying prong B in Sebago. If your honors will recall, the court drew a distinction between cab drivers who paid a flat fee to rent the cabs and the medallions and limo drivers who paid a portion of the profits to the limo companies. The test that they want, this graduated fee being the test for the threshold inquiry, that's prong B. That means that if you fail the service threshold, you also <laughs> fail prong, prong B. There's no opportunity at all to pass the ABC test. And I want to be clear about the record here and about the impact on franchising. And Justice Kafka, I'm not prepared to believe that the Commonwealth is prepared to say that every franchise relationship is no longer a franchise relationship, but an employment relationship. The IFA they're good, they're attached good. to its brief, the excerpts from the franchise agreements of the best known franchisors in the world, Hilton, Marriott, Burger King, McDonald's, Pizza Hut, and Dunkin', which has over 1,000 locations in this state. Every single one of those franchise agreements show that the franchisees perform some obligations to get their franchise. Every one of those franchise agreements show that the franchisees pay a portion of their profits to the franchisor as compensation for the services and the rights that they receive under the franchise agreements. That means that every single one of those franchisees of all of those systems, including multimillionaires that own hotels, including multimillionaire franchisees that are actually public companies are going to figure out that they're employees and no longer independent contractors. I recognize the problem. I'm trying to understand how to work, and so are you, which is services. How do we define services in a way that draws distinctions between the owner of the Hilton Hotel and the cute operator of that janitorial service where he's converting his janitors into franchise. How do we make this language work to draw that distinction? Help us out, because I can't do it. I, I think there's two ways, and we actually spent a lot of time thinking about this, trying to distill the themes from the cases. And there really are two. Uh, and it depends on distinguishing contractual obligations that are services versus contractual obligations that are conditions 
to the provision of those services. For example, if I hire you to paint my house and I say I'm going to pay you $500, you're providing a service to me. If we put in our contract that I'm going to pay you that amount within 30 days, that's a precondition to the provision of those services. You tell the difference just as Judge Gorton did by following the money. People perform services with an expectation, expressed or implied, that they're going to get paid for it. If they don't have an expectation of getting paid, that's called a favor. And the AG now concedes that the ICL is not intended to cover favors. We acknowledge, as we did in our brief, that that test doesn't cover everything. People will come up with attempts to evade the Wage Act. But there's a consistent second theme that covers all of those cases. And this is it. And this is the definition that we worked out. The first part of it ties back to what Judge Gordon did. Service is labor performed for the benefit of another for an express or implied promise of a fee as in the Black's Law Dictionary. And we're the only party that's offered a textual definition of the word service, by the way. The second part deals with the attempts to evade the wage act. But, but you've added this word labor. Service is labor performed for fee. That's sort of what I was asking earlier about is employment a, con a condition of the meaning of service, right? But it doesn't, doesn't say that, right? You've added the word labor. Um, labor, work, a benefit, I don't think it makes a difference, Your Honor. Doing something for another person with an expectation of payment, that covers virtually every case. The but only cases it doesn't cover, Your Honor. It doesn't it cover the Hilton, too? They're providing a hotel um, and they're running the hotel and, and paying Hilton. I, I'm just, un, I don't understand why the franchisor isn't performing services there. The, the franchisor is performing me, the services, franchisee. the franchisee is not. Because there is no expectation from the franchisee, in that case, the Hilton franchisee, that they're going to get a penny of Hilton's money. They're going to be compensated by the money that they obtain from their own customers renting the rooms. Just as 7-Eleven franchisees never expect and never get a penny of Hilton's money. Everything that they get is a portion of the money that their franchises generate by selling products to their own customers. As to the second prime, again, recognizing that there are attempts to evade the Wage Act out there. But hold on, but sec, just, it, I just find it harder than that. So in this case, the 7-Eleven is providing a lot of stuff to them. It's giving them, you know, and they're providing, aren't they providing a lot of, I mean, I get, you're saying the only thing they're providing is money back to them. They're providing nothing to 7-Eleven. They're paying for the services that 7-Eleven provides. 7-Eleven gives them real estate. It gives them a trademark license. It gives them the right to use equipment. And it gives them the right to use 7-Eleven's operating system that it has honed for but decades. 7-Eleven has given them the name brand. Correct. It's given them all this information on how to run a successful grocery store, whatever these things are. Um, and isn't that, it's, they're, it's a mutual, it's mutually beneficial and they're both help. They're both providing services to each other. They're not providing labor services, I don't know, but they're, they're providing some services to each other. 7-Eleven is providing services to the franchisees for which they pay. The franchisees are providing services to their own businesses. They are doing the things they're supposed to do under the franchise agreement, both to protect the services that 7-Eleven is giving them, to protect the trademark rights, and to protect the brand, and to grow their business. They don't get paid one penny by 7-Eleven. There is no expectation, express or implied, that they will ever receive anything from 7-Eleven. So, I mean, under your test, then 7-Eleven is the employee? I'm sorry. I, I think if you adopted their interpretation, then yes, Your Honor. No, but even I, under your test, labor f for promises of a fee, isn't that what 7-Eleven is providing? So that can't be the test. Well, I, I think that that will cover all non-absurd employment relationships, Your Honor. Uh -huh. I think that for the others, uh, the consistent theme, theme that runs through the commercial cleaning cases, the newspaper delivery cases, even the exotic dancer cases is this, that a service may also be provided in circumstances where a putative employer has engaged in a scheme to evade the wage laws, such as where an individual provides services to a putative employer's own customers. And if you think back 
at all of the cases this court has dealt with over the years. <coughs> Think about what happened in Sebago. Think about what happened in the commercial cleaning cases. In each one of those cases, what was happening was there was a top tier entity that was using, whether you call them employees, independent contractors, franchisees, whatever they were in that particular case, to perform the services that they had agreed to provide to their own customers. In Sebago, the radio associations were using the drivers to provide the services that the radio associations had sold to their own customers through the voucher program. The concern with respect to the medallion owners was the same as it concerned the advertising. The medallion owners had sold advertising space on their cabs. The drivers were providing those services, the ones that the medallion owners sold to their customers by driving around with whatever sort of ads were put on the cabs. In all of those cases, in the carry opinion that the AG relies on, the same thing. So can I ask you to pause there on the medallion owners? Yes. They were not the ad space um, circulating with each cab was not something, a labor that the drivers were providing for a fee. It was a benefit. It was a benefit, yes. Of, right. Yeah, so there was definitely a benefit to the medallion owners to be able to say, hey, look, our guys go out all over. But the but, drivers were not being promised <coughs> a fee for that. Correct. So that, how does that fit with your definition? Isn't that a problem with your definition? It, it's not a problem with my definition because it's covered by the second part of the definition, Your Honor. They were providing the services to the medallion owner's customers that the medallion owners agreed to provide. They were simp simply a substitute source for the labor necessary to provide those advertising services. Why can't we just do your second part? I think you could do the second one other than the fact that I'm not sure that that would encompass the traditional employment scenarios in which someone expects to be paid for doing work. Mm -hmm. That is the common sense definition of employment. Okay. Uh, I, sorry, are you done? I, I didn't mean, I just don't understand. Say, let's do the, the 7-Eleven franchisee who's working 12-hour days in that store. Um, you know, he, he, he or she works the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. shift. And without that seven, 12 hours of work by that person, 7-Eleven is not making money on that store, right? It, and that person's not performing services for 7-Eleven, too? Because I, I understand the owner who's never there, who's you know, hired a bunch of employees, all those employees are covered by the Wage Act and protected by the Wage Act because that guy is their employer. But this person who's sort of the self-employed franchisee, which a lot of these people at least are in part, isn't, isn't that person performing employment services for, because 7-Eleven, without him, 7-Eleven doesn't make any money. Well, that's not entirely correct, Your Honor. 7-Eleven is paid based upon the performance of the franchise, not based upon the labor of any doesn't particular get any employee. Gross, doesn't get a percentage of the gross from that? It's a percentage of the gross revenue generated by the store. So, but, but if he's not working, by him working 12 hours, they're not hiring someone else to work 12 hours. Um, and that doesn't that affect the revenues? That, that's the same as any business. The franchisee can show up and work if they want, or they don't have to show up and work. Each of these plaintiffs admitted a deposition that they work when they want, and they don't work when they don't want to work. So it's not dependent upon their labor. It's dependent upon the store's performance. This is a shared but, economic benefit, right. which this court made clear both in Jinx and Patel was not enough to trigger the service inquiry. The fact that it's a graduated fee makes no difference at all. And the AG's brief actually proves this point. They say in deciding whether or not something is a service, you need to take a look at what the worker is actually doing. Fine. Take a look at what the worker is actually doing. Whether the franchise pays a flat fee or a graduated fee to 7-Eleven makes no difference. The franchisee, to the extent they choose to work in the store, will still be doing the exact same thing. The only thing that will result 
will be that the payments that franchisees make to 7-Eleven will be entirely inequitable because a franchisee that runs a store that generates a million dollars a year in gross sales should not be paying to 7-Eleven the same amount of money that a franchisee that is fortunate, to run a, fortunate enough to run a store that makes $7 million a year pays to 7-Eleven. The, this graduated concept exists in all franchises so that franchisees pay an equitable amount based upon the benefits they receive from the services that the franchisors provide. Unless the court has any further questions.